the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, uh, my name is Sharon Goldman. I am the program director at the Brothman Center for Jewish Life here at the 92nd Street Y. And a very, very warm welcome to introducing Henrietta Sold, Lost Love Found Mission. And tonight, it is uh, co-presented both with Lilith Magazine and also Hadassah Women's Zionist Organization of America, both the New York chapter and the national chapter. Um, before I introduce this evening's guest, um, I just want to tell you about a couple upcoming programs that may be of interest to you. Uh, first of all, this event is part of a new series we have here, which is called Biography of a Jewish Life. And we have one more program, and that is on Tuesday, January 23rd. I should say one more program in the series, and that is Introducing, introducing Rashi. And we actually are, have another program, Introducing, introducing Mark Chagall, but that one is sold out, unfortunately. Um, Another program that uh, you're invited to is part of our Jewish Literary Exchange, and that is a conversation with Alice Madison in case we're separated. She's going to be here speaking about her newest book with uh, Daniel Septimus. Um, of course, to learn about these programs and also other 92nd Street Y programs, please feel free to pick up our new catalog or uh, visit our website at www.92y.org. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Bela Shargel, who I have to just mention that I was um, honored to hear her speak a few years ago um, when I was the Associate Director of Isabella Friedman, which is a Jewish retreat center up in Connecticut. And uh, she was one of our most favorite speakers of the summer, so I was so thrilled to invite her back uh, in this new position of mine. Um, Bela Shargell is a social and intellectual historian at Manhattanville College. She is the author of four books, including Lost Love, The Untold Story of Henrietta Sold. And her books will be for sale, and she will also sign, after, sign her books after the event. Um, and for those of you who may be curious about Lilith Magazine or about Hadassah, um, there are representatives among you who are more than happy to answer answer any questions you may have. And, uh, <laughs> and now, without further ado, Bela Shargell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. I wish I had your clarion voice, but mine has a little weak tonight. I hope you can all hear me in the back. OK. Now, it's all the rage to establish personal connections to historical biographies. And I think that the current um, uh, series, Next Book, does that very well. Are any of you familiar with the Shakin series, Next Book? People take historical personages um, um, and they do that. So I'm going to tell you that my connection to Henrietta Zold is a very personal one, but it does bear a resemblance to an umbrella. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about Henrietta Zold's older contemporary, whose name was Mark Twain. Mark Twain used to tell the following anecdote. He had a, an umbrella that was battered, and he wanted to get rid of it. So he threw it into a waste can. Someone recognized it and brought it back. Then he tossed it down a deep well. It, it bubbled to the top. Someone recognized it and brought it back. Finally, he lent it to a friend and never saw it again. <laughs> Now, I've been living in the New York area for about 36 years, but I was born and raised in Baltimore. 
For the first 25 years that I was living in this area, the umbrella that I've been trying, that I was trying to lose, was the provincial quality that most New York Jews attribute to people from lesser communities, especially lesser Jewish communities. Now, turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century, I have to say now, New York has always excited me. So I selected Israel Friedlander for my first book. He was a, he was a European, but he lived in, in New York for many years. Uh, he was an important Zionist leader, community activist, as well as professor of Bible at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I followed his fascinating but all too short career. At age 43, he was murdered in, in the Ukraine while on a relief mission for the JDC. Now, did that book about Friedlander who lived in New York make me abandon my Baltimore roots? Not exactly, because one of his best friends was Henrietta Zold, a native of Baltimorean. Undeterred, I wrote another book. This should get me really into New York. Actually, it was about Westchester County. One of the best pictures in the book, however, is a picture of the Mount Vernon chapter of Hadassah in the 1920s. There are three very fashionably dressed women sitting there. Mount Vernon was a major community in those days. And sitting in front of them, they're wearing cloche hats, very fashionably dressed. And sitting in front of them is Henrietta Zold with her white hair and her rather longish skirt. Now. I decided that I just had to give up. Like Mark Twain, I gave the umbrella to a friend, and that friend was me. In other words, I returned to my own roots and researched the life of Henrietta Zold. Zold lived for many years in New York, as you probably know. She spent some time in Philadelphia, but uh, the, her last years were in Jerusalem. But first, I want to take you back to Baltimore in 1898, when she was still there. Now, New Yorkers seem to think that the Lower East Side during that period was the only important Jewish neighborhood. Now, that's really not true. Um, to say that is to ignore Philadelphia's South Street, Chicago's Maxwell Street, and so on. And there was indeed a large Jewish community in East Baltimore. Now, in 1898, um, a young man of about 24 by the name of Jake met an even younger girl. Her name was Becky. Jake and Becky fell in love, but his family nixed the prospect of their marriage. There were three reasons. The first reason was her youth. She was only 17, but he was a man of 24. The second reason was that she was a green heir. Does everybody know what a green heir is? She'd literally just gotten off the boat. Uh, and um, his family had, he had lived in, in, in the United States for about 10 years. But the third reason was the most important. She was a Galicianer. And he was a, <laughs> right. Nevertheless, the intermarriage took place. <laughs> they eloped. Now, how do, you, how do two kids elope when you don't have any money and you live in East Baltimore? Well, you take a streetcar and you go to a nicer section, not where the immigrants are living, but where the Deutsche are living, where the German Jews are living. And there they found themselves a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Benjamin Zold. Of course, he was Henrietta's father. And Jacob and Rebecca Rosenberg are my grandparents. So that's my personal connection to Henrietta Zold. Now, not every Baltimore Jew has such yichas. <laughs> but when I spoke about this book, whenever I speak about this book in Baltimore, I get the largest audience, even larger than this, all right? Like three times, four times. Now, Coming from Baltimore, I learned about her from the beginning. My mother worshipped her. And I really thought that I knew everything about this remarkable woman. But when I began my research, I realized that I didn't understand her in the least. 
Sure, I could recite her accomplishments, founder of one of the first night schools in the country for immigrants, first editor of the Jewish Publication Society, founder of Hadassah, um, and all the work she did for health and welfare in Israel. I'll get to those later. But the woman that I got to know was so much more and that's because I did something that would be illegal to do if she were still alive. I read her mail, and I also had access to her personal journal. My book, got to advertise my book, <laughs> A Lost Love, The Untold Story of Henrietta Zold, is based upon those letters and that journal. And I, the reason that I wrote it was really to recover the inner life of Henrietta Zold. And whenever you see pictures of her, she's an elderly woman, you know. Um, but I want to show that she was not born at age 60. And more amazingly, she, it wasn't until she was in her 40s that she fell in love for the first time. All of this comes out in the journal. Now, a little bit about her life to that point. I think it's familiar to some of you. Um, she was born, as I said, in Baltimore in 1860. Um, she showed very, she was, um, a, well, her father, Benjamin Zold, the man who married my grandparents, <clears throat> didn't have any Y chromosomes. He fathered eight daughters. Three, three of them died tragically in, in infancy. But he raised five daughters. Henrietta was the oldest, and she was always sitting by his side. The family had come from Hungary, and Hungary, the educated Jew, spoke German. She learned to speak German almost as well as she knew English. Um, he went over all of his, um, his literary activities with her. He was a great scholar. And um, she was extremely close to her father, and maybe that's why she never was really interested in any man during her youth. Um, she became a writer herself, writing, to, writing an article, se several articles, at, starting at age 17, to the Jewish Messenger in New York. It was a magazine in New York at the time. And she took the very romantic name of Shalameth, Shulamit. Um, uh, when she, she, she and I went to the same high school. When she went there, it was called the Western Female High School. <laughs> um, it's still female, by the way, although they took out the female by the time I got there. Uh, and, and then she became a teacher, and as I mentioned before, a founder of the first night school in the country for immigrants. And it was there that she, that she got to know the people from Eastern Europe, and she also um, became an ardent Zionist. In, 18, in, in, in 1888, the Jewish Publication Society was founded, and she was the only woman on the publications committee. Um, the, it foundered for a while, and they found that they really needed someone to put it all together, to take in the manuscripts, to edit, to translate, and so on. And they offered her a job. So she, she left teaching and took that job. Her, her, her title was Secretary to the Publications Committee of the Jewish Publication Society. But what she really was, was the first editor. Now, if you look at the publicity of the Jewish Publication Society, they always say she was their first editor. But that's not what she was called then. So this was a full-time job. And then in 1902, her father died. By this time, the sisters were married and scattered. One of them had died, the, um, of the five had died. And she and her mother decided that they would move to New York and they would move to 123rd Street in New York because a new building had been erected for the Jewish Theological Seminary, reorganized in, at, at that time. And she was going to enroll. Um, she uh, asked Solomon Schechter, who was the man who, had re, who was the head of it and had reorganized it, and he said it's okay for her to take, all, to take courses I don't think it occurred to either of them that she should be a rabbi, although my friend Mel Skult over there, is a scholar, always calls her the first female rabbi, <laughs> because she took all the courses that the, that the um, other students took and excelled. I saw her, her record, her school record in, in the archives. 
So now she had two full-time jobs, living across the street from the seminary, doing all that work for the Publication Society, uh, but she found herself a third. This third job was, was not really a job, but it was more than a job, because she found Professor Levy Louis Ginsburg. Professor Ginsburg was the greatest Talmudic scholar of his day. The um, encyclopedia, the Jewish encyclopedia was just coming out then, and he wrote 400 articles for it. Now, Henrietta wrote 15 articles, which isn't bad for someone who didn't even have a college education, but he wrote 400, and they had been in correspondence because he was, she was going to translate his Legends of the Jews but she never saw him until, and for a long time, it was just um, written correspondence, until she went to a meeting in January of 1903, and then something very strange happened to her. She just got a feeling that this was the man for her. She didn't know what to do about it. What she did know is that it was an all but impossible relationship, because at the time when she first saw him, she was 42, and he was 29. In September, the, the, she and her mother moved to New York. She started to take classes, and he was one of the teachers. Because she knew her, of her feelings, and she felt it was just an impossible situation, she tried to run away from him. But he kept pursuing her. In his case, it wasn't the love of a man for a woman but the need of an immigrant scholar for a translator, fine English stylist, and sensitive editor. So after class, he would come up to her and say, um, Miss Zold, always called her Miss Zold, Miss Zold, um, I have a, a, a letter that I, that I received that I have to answer it in good English. He was an immigrant, of course. Can you translate it for me? What could she say? He was her teacher, so she translated it for him. A few weeks later, Miss Zold, I've written these articles for the Jewish Quarterly Review, and I'm not sure the English is so good. <laughs> Can you English them for me? So she agreed. Before she knew it, this was her third job, doing all of this work for him but not being able to say anything, because the only salary that she required <clears throat> was the chance to help the man that she loved in every way that she could. What she called her bittersweet happiness was reinforced by frequent strolls with Ginsburg along leafy Riverside Drive, brisker walks in Morningside Park, don't try it now, and letters during his summer vacations in Europe. Even as she performed all of her duties for the Jewish Publication Society, she arranged her schedule to meet his needs, to the point of uncharacteristically breaking prior appointments whenever he summoned her. Her shifting moods depended upon his attentions to her. Melancholy in 1904, 5, and 6, when she harbored few hopes of reciprocation of her passion. Sanguine during the summer of 1907, when confidences exchanged with Ginsburg crossed the ocean frequently because he would go away on vacation and she was stuck doing her work for the Publication Society in New York. Most astounding <clears throat> was her capacity for construing her beloved's abuse of her abundant talents and limited means as a virtue. Ginsburg was a frequent guest at the, at the Zold table, dining there once or twice a week. For recreation, the friends took walks, as I said, and discussed the works in progress. Seldom did they dine out and take advantage of the cultural attractions of New York. Shamelessly, Ginsburg borrowed money, paper, and stamps, and often forgetting to repay her. Dutifully, Zold published, purchased scrapbooks and filled them with all of the articles that he had written. Yet he never thanked her for his services, and by her, that was okay. To Ginsburg, she ministered as a mother to a spoiled son, peeling his oranges, cracking open his boiled eggs, doing without her entree so that he might have a second portion. To do his work as well as hers, she slept no more than five hours a night. 
When he telephoned a request to see her after she had prepared for bed, she quickly dressed and met him at the door. Masochistic gestures such as these reflected the density and intensity of her passion. To her personal amazement, Ginsburg awakened a long suppressed sexuality, belatedly arousing what she calls in her journal, that peculiar young happy feeling. Their first encounter initiated her into what she called the cosmical mystery of sex. The controlled and prudish middle-aged spinster became obsessed with this young man's every lineament. In her mind's eye, she continuously reviewed Ginsburg's blue eyes, his guttural giggle, his face framed by what she called a little silk cap, and his body. Next to him, she confided in her journal, all other men seem like sawdust stuffed into coat, vest, and trousers. Awareness of his body brought her a new sense of her own. I am a dependent woman with a keen emotional nature, she exclaimed. A distinctly feminine woman, not an intellectual abstraction. A red-blooded woman with red blood running in her veins. Every encounter with him produced a somatic reaction. She found herself quivering and palpitating, I'm using her words, <laughs> at the very sight of him, and trembling at each physical contact, however inadvertent, however innocent. She became a bundle of nervous energy. Whenever he called, she flew, again, I'm emphasizing the verb, she flew to the telephone or the door. She kissed his books and clasped his letters to her heart. And when she thought he loved her, she jubilated and sang. <clears throat> Here's a graphic um, example of this. <clears throat> of course, there were times when my passion absorbed and mastered me. One evening, it had been snowing and raining and sleeting, but it stopped, and a high whistling wind arose. I could not stay. The pain in my heart drew me out at 8 o'clock in the evening, and I raced around Morningside Park screaming at the top of my voice whenever the wind was noisy enough to drown out my agony. In 1907, Ginsburg took a leave of absence to be with his dying father in Amsterdam. Defenses down, his letters revealed his most intimate feelings, a sense of inadequacy, of not living up to his father's expectations. When his father died, he encouraged daily letters from her, and her letters became a comfort. I'm going to read you the first. <clears throat> My dear friend, I have just heard that the bitter and inevitable has happened. May God give you the strength to bear the anguish of your bereavement, and in time to come when your grief will have lost its first cruel sting, may he turn the affliction into an added source of spiritual power. I write no word of sympathy, no word of consolation. You are assured of the one without a word. The other must spring from the depths of your own being, and it will. Pretty nice consolation letter, I should say. Upon Ginsburg's return to New York, the relationship assumed a new dimension, an even closer friendship. Now he dined at her house almost every night. No, uh, she, it was, they were so close and they were together so much that she really thought that he loved her. But again, in 1908, he went back to Europe to wind up his father's affairs. And, but this time, her letters didn't hide her true feelings. I'm going to read you just a little bit from one. She wrote this right after he left. <clears throat> New York has today consoled itself. From Thursday noon until Sunday morning, the heavens dripped and showered and poured. The purpose of all that water that came down must have been to bemoan your going away. A few days later, she wrote that the most exciting thing of her week was to read a report of the sighting of his vessel off the coast of Scotland. And she berated him for even suggesting that he had left her too much work to do. 
You'll make me happy when you let me have a tiny, humble share of your work. The scholar leads the life of peace, and the modest translator is pleased to be permitted a glimpse of that charmed country. Soon, however, her letters were few and far between, and three times he called her a victim. She was so worried that when his ship came in, she didn't go to the dock to meet him, as was her wont. Ginsburg got off the ship, went to his brother's house, dropped his bags, he was living with his brother, and then he went straight to the Jewish Theological Seminary, where all of his colleagues were sitting at a table facing, remember, she's living on 123rd Street where the seminary was, on the other side of the street. So they see him come in, he walks in, and he tells them that he was engaged to be married. While in Berlin, he had, quartered a, he had courted a lovely young lady by the name of Adela Katzenstein. And after only three meetings, we call them dates, she had consented to be his wife. His colleagues sat there with their mouths open because everybody had assumed he was engaged to Henrietta's old. They watched him cross the street and ring the doorbell of the Zold house. The faculty's response was summed up in the words of my friend Israel Friedlander, who said, the cad. Henrietta Zold, upon hearing this, held on to the table for strength and congratulated him. But when he left, she broke down and then suffered a nervous breakdown. Now, up to this point, she hadn't told anybody about her passion for him, although her sister caught her crying once and, and she guessed it. But now she told everybody in the seminary circle and Zionist circles and all of the circles in which she traveled of how he had rejected her. So she suffered for about four weeks, and then she decided to put her pen to paper and begin a personal journal. Tuesday, November 17th, 1908. Today it is four weeks since my only real happiness in life was killed by a single word. Since then I have hardly been conscious of living. There has been only suffering, nights and days and days and nights of suffering. All these weeks composed of, of minutes of misery I've done nothing but remember, and it has been a thorny crown of sorrows, this remembering bittersweet days. Today the thought comes to my mind that if I put all my memories down, not necessarily in order of time, but only so, so as to have them before me as an object outside of myself, perhaps it will help me to adjust myself to the new, cold, loveless life I must henceforth live. <clears throat> now when I read these words, I knew that this journal deserved publication. Her journal stuck a chord in my life for a very personal reason. In 1986, I lost a son. He was a disabled youth who had endured many times <clears throat> the replacement of a ventricular shunt, but this time he died. And when I heard this, for a long time, I was unable to cry. I went about concerned with my other children and teaching and lecturing. On, at that time, my first book had been published, but I couldn't feel anything. That summer, though, I went to a rural retreat for teachers where we were instructed to write down our feelings. I poured out my soul into that little notebook, and when it was finished, I found relief. I could feel again. Now my story could not be more dissimilar from Zold's, and my notebook has long since disappeared. Yet over that bridge of 85 years, Henrietta Zold and I share something essential. What we had in common is what has been come, have come to be called the writing cure. 
As Henrietta wrote down the high points, the low points, the disappointments, the resentments, the pain receded into a dull ache. It turned out that the friendship had produced hidden benefits for her. Because she cared for Ginsburg and knew of her concern for her, his, she was able to open not only her heart, but also her mind and prepare the ground for a very productive later life. Not that the cure was immediate. It took a long time for her to get over the shock of her disappointment. Two of her earlier biographies have claimed that it made her into a permanent depressive and, that, and therefore it caused only harm. I don't agree. I found in the letters that she exchanged with Ginsburg a key to her future accomplishments. For the first time in her life, she had articulated the problems of being a woman in a man's world and a single woman in a married world. Soon she would transfer these feelings into action. But first, she had to revisit her life with Ginsburg. Now, Ginsburg had been a good friend. And in his letters, he had ch chastised her for, uh, for taking on more work than she should. Since when has it been the duty of a secretary to act as a translator of books? Remember, she was still called secretary. Of course the JPS is not entirely to blame. You yourself are responsible for a great deal of your trouble. You ought to have your work and duties exactly defined. If the JPS expects you to be ein Mädchen für Alice, a woman for all tasks, translator, author, collector of statistics, then let them look for somebody else. Her response, dear Dr. Ginsburg, I am prepared to meet you more than halfway. When, my, when I look back upon the years of my secretaryship, I realize that I actually usurp duties if that is possible. And now I expect others to protect me against myself. I was too eager to serve an apprenticeship. And not having had proper and self-respecting confidence in myself, <clears throat> only the confidence one places in an upper, well-tried, loyal servant with the soul of a servant. Thinking this over and with other exchanges with Ginsburg, she realized two things. First, that more than the Jewish Publication Society, it was Ginsburg who had exploited her. And second, that responsibility belongs as well to the secondary role of women in America and American Jewish society. Throughout her life, but especially at this critical juncture, Henrietta Zold was alert to social conven convention and her own ambiguous social role. Within her own milieu, she was at once the most and the least conventional of women modest in dress and deportment, never one to stoop to feminine wiles. Years lady, later, someone tried to put lipstick on her mouth and she went like that. She was a religious woman devoted to traditional values. Yet this rabbi's daughter also surmounted ba boundaries, both personal and professional. Women were beginning to enter the workforce at the turn of the century, but seldom did they re, uh, receive the pros, uh, achieve the responsibility that she had of her position at the JPS, no matter what it was called. And few women knocked at the doors of theological seminaries, Jewish or Christian. Outside the family circle, she functioned in a world of men. Here are some of the organizations she was involved in. The Jewish Publication Society, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the Federation of American Zionists, and the New York Kehillah. And there, virtually all of her peers were male. Many lines, however, remained to be crossed. A rigid formality governed personal relations. Neither in written correspondence nor in cordial discourse did friends address each other by their given names. Even when Ginsburg and Zoll worked together every day and dined at her house almost daily, it remained, Miss Zold, 
Professor Ginsburg, societal correctness was no trivial matter. It informs Zold and Ginsburg's <clears throat> entire relationship and helps explain why Henrietta never expressed her feelings in so many words, though she was often tempted to do so, and why Ginsburg could blatantly ignore the many obvious tokens of her affection. Relations with men, members of the opposite sex remained fundamentally asymmetrical. I hope some of the women from Lilith are here. Men were expected to seize the initiative, and women were expected to respond, but not too eagerly. In her journal, when she thought back upon the second time that she met him, she marveled at her brazen act. Do you know what she did? She extended her hand to him before he extended his to her. One time, she, at the beginning of the relationship, when she invited him spontaneously to dinner, she fretted over what she called her unwomanly boldness, the, con the convention that she had most frequently hoped to defer, of course, to defy, of course, was the most fundamental discrepancy in their relationship, that 13-year gap between their ages. By the way, he was 13 years older than Adela Katzenstein, and nobody bothered with that. Three years after the completion of this journal that I've called Meditation on Lost Love, Henrietta Zold founded Hadassah. Now, an early biographer glibly redeemed, uh, deemed her renewed Zionist activism as compensation for having lost the prize that she really wanted. And later in life, when I interviewed Adela Ginsburg, actually about Friedlander, she told me I was the founder of Hadassah. Okay. <clears throat> this was decidedly not the case. Because even during this relationship with Ginsburg, Henrietta Zoll never lost her interest in Zionism. And we see this in the letters that she wrote him and the clippings that she inserted in the letters. All of them have to do with Zionism. And that interest was kindled in contact in Baltimore with those East European immigrants that she met when she had uh, founded that night school. And another factor was in aiding her recovery was the affection and, re and respect that been lav had been lavished upon her in her Baltimore home. Now, the JPS had never given her a, a leave of absence at all, not even a vacation, really. So they, now everybody felt sorry for her, especially because she was telling everybody what happened to her and she was a, a real wreck. So they granted her a leave of absence, first of all to visit her family in Hungary. She was going with her mother, but then someone donated extra money so that she could go to the land of Israel. It was a very tough thing to go to Israel in 1909. And friends had assured her that all she had to do was see the new Yishuv with its rampant disease and tottering new Jewish farm villages, and that would cure her of her longtime attachment to Zionism. But of course, the exact opposite was the case. Seeing Palestine for the first time only strengthened that Zionism that she had always held dear. The founding in, of Hadassah in 1912 was a logical progression in Zionism, not a means of sublimating her passion for Ginsburg. Now, Ginsburg had never approved of women lecturing in public. So when she returned from Eretz Yisrael, she began to do just that, telling everybody who, who would listen about the new Zionist settlements as well as the problems that she had seen. She even used the newfangled device of a stereopticon to show slides. There was a gendered response as well. For several years, she had participated in a club with younger women devoted to books on Zionism. That club, that New York club, was called Hadassah. Now, Henrietta resolved to add practical work to the educational. After transferring the New York group named Hadassah into an activist club, she contacted women Zionists in cities all over the East and the Midwest and urged them to form similar clubs. At first, the clubs had all different names. 
But then they finally decided that they would all take that New York name of Hadassah. Now, from the onset, she made sure that the women of Hadassah adopted their own programs, separate from what the male Zionists were doing. Now, the male Zionists, when they saw how successful Hadassah groups were, wanted to absorb Hadassah into the, the ZOA, but she refused. Hadassah was never a lady's auxiliary. It was and remained women, the woman's Zionist organization with its own programs and its own projects. And in time, it would become America's largest and most accomplished Zionist organization and one of the largest volunteer organizations even today. In 1920, having at last submitted her resignation to the JPS, she traveled to Palestine, but this time she stayed. She lived there on and off for the rest of her long life. She died in 1945. In 1921, she founded Hadassah's nursing school, the first of its kind in the Middle East. She returned for two years to, to build up Hadassah, and it's from that return visit that I had the picture in my Westchester book of her visiting Mount Vernon. But by 1927, she saw that Hadassah was very well on its feet. They didn't need her anymore. So she resigned from all offices and joined the executive in Israel. It was called the Va'ad Lu'umi. It was a three-person executive that was kind of a shadow government. That's one of the reasons why when Israel began, it was just easy to do that because there had already been a shadow government before that time. In 1934, she was 73 years old. Nevertheless, she didn't hesitate to lead Youth Aliyah in the Yishuv. No longer an officer of Hadassah, she nevertheless persuaded Rose Jacobs, the national president, to dedicate Hadassah's efforts to transfer Jewish children from Palestine, uh, from Germany to Palestine. It was not simple to deal with the German government. Can you imagine the Nazi government she had to deal with? And it wasn't much easier to satisfy the German Jewish bureaucrats who had to choose which children to send. Three times this septuagenarian ventured into the belly of the beast, into Nazi Germany, to deal with all of them. And then when she came back, she had to deal with the British mandatory authorities who didn't, weren't for too happy about giving too many certificates for Jewish children. Nearly a decade later, when she was still head of Youth Aliyah, she was called upon to choose places in Palestine for for uh, a group of children called the Children of Tehran. Any of you ever heard of that? Okay. In February 1943, at the height of the Holocaust, 830 children from Poland reached Palestine. They had all suffered terrible adversity. Hapless youngsters, infants, school-aged school children, and adolescents, 80% of them had no more parents. They had probably left Poland with parents. Their parents died along the way. And there had been one sector of 14,000 Polish citizens, Jewish and Christians, military and civilian, who fled the Nazi occupation of Poland under the leadership of General Anders. The refugees had moved to Siberia, then turned south into the Central Asian republics. Thousands died of exposure, disease, and malnutrition, among them the parents of many of these children. Finally, they reached Persia. Representatives of the Zionist youth movements in Palestine met these children in Tehran and conducted them to Israel. That's why they're called children of Tehran, even though they're Polish kids. When they arrived, the Jewish children especially were in a sorry state. This is from what one of them later wrote. We cried for our lost childhood and for our fathers and mothers. And when we thought we cried ourselves out, another truth hit us all at once. We children had deserted our fathers and mothers to save our own lives. That isn't exactly true. The parents usually said, leave, we can't go any further. And then we discovered that we still had more tears left to shed. Now their arrival in Eretz Yisrael aroused great excitement. Now Henrietta Zold had the thankless task of selecting places in Zionist organizations. 
Now, you know about Zionist organizations. You know about Jewish organizations. Every group in Israel wanted them. She had to decide where to send them, to, to the Orthodox, to the ultra-Orthodox, to the different labor groups, okay? And what she did, someone who was one of these children of Tehran told me, she, uh, she sat on a, actually they arrived in Haifa, they came up the, by train, I don't want to get into how they got there, but anyway, they arrived in, in Haifa, and there were a group of tables seated on, on, really on top of the Carmel, and she sat in the middle in a table, and as children would come to her, she'd say, um, did your father have a beard? You know, you can't ask a kid, was your father orthodox? You know, did your father have a beard? Did your mother light candles on Shabbos? And depending on their answers, she would assign them to the various installations. But still, she received a lot of criticism, as you can imagine. She had to endure that. Now, you have to remember how old she was when she did all of this. All right. She um, had the AARP been in operation at the time, I'm sure they would have picked her for the cover of their magazine. In the youth Aliyah would seem in schools, she was always welcome. Wherever she went, children greeted her. And for a long time, especially for those German children at the beginning, she knew every one of their names. Now, a friend of ours who died about five years ago was one of those children from Germany. He loved to tell the story of his personal contact with the woman whom he, all the kids called the Alta Dama. When she was inspecting the school, she noticed that his jacket was missing a button. She said, do you have the button? So he pulled it out of, the, out of his pocket. She took the, her great big pocketbook that she, that she always carried and pulled out a needle and thread and sewed it back on. Hadassah then was not the booby prize for a disappointed spinster, nor was Adele Ginsburg its founder. It was the creation of Henrietta Zold, a convinced and lifelong Zionist. It took a strong effort of will to overcome the obsession with Ginsburg and her own doubts. But once this was accomplished, then the path was clear. Discussions and correspondence with Ginsburg functioned as an agenda for the second half of her life. Because the script was already in place before he rejected her, Henrietta Zold was eventually able to follow it and in the process attain greatness. After I take a draft of water, I'd like to entertain some questions. Okay. Well, that always has been, that's, all right. Um, the question was, uh, actually, why do I focus on her rejection? Um, well, because nobody else wrote about it. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and the people who did write about it and, and put it in their books as, I'm really, you know, history is always, if, if you're gonna write something about somebody that somebody else has written about it, uh, then you have to find a new angle. It's called revisionist history. Now, not what we call Holocaust revisionism. That's not revisionism. That's a denial. <laughs> but every historian is a revisionist historian. If you write about something anybody else did, right? Look how many books have been written on the American Revolution. Look at all those books that come out now. All right. So the thing that I did that, well, that was, is my innovation is that all the people who wrote about her relationship with him, the, first of all, they didn't have access to this, to these journals and letters, uh, especially the journal. But secondly, they, um, they constantly stressed her depression. If you read Joan Dash's book, if you read, Fe and she's really based on what Feynman writes, He's, um, he, her, his biography called Woman of Valor, the first one that came out. Um, and what I found is that be, even though she suffered with the relationship, and I had to tell you about that, she uh, learned a lot from him. 
And he encouraged her in a way by telling her, why do you have to listen to the JPS? By call, they call you secretary and they give you all this work, right? So she, she did benefit from the relationship. She suffered, but intellectually and morally, I think. And uh, she gained from it. And she also had a sense of being a woman that she really didn't have before. She was so busy being one of the guys, you know, on all those organizations, the only woman in the organization. But here she, she had something that gave her an a yiud. It was a push. To, uh, um, what's a yiud? Uh, a, a goal, a goal. Uh, um, um, yeah, a goal that she could that uh, uh, that she could achieve on her own. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I mentioned my first book was on Israel Friedlander, and I was going to write the next book on Louis Ginsburg. Okay. Um, I went through all of his letters, and you know when you go through ar archives and you find letters, they're not letters that you wrote unless they're in carbon, and then they're not usually very interesting. <laughs> you find letters that other people wrote to you. I mean, you save letters that people have sent to you, right? So I found, I went all through, I got to the end of the S's, S-Z, and I found this packet of letters in the seminary archives, archives of the Jewish Theological Seminary Library, of letters that, that Louis Ginsburg had written to Henrietta Zold. They were very interesting. So I... I contacted, or I went to Israel, I went to the Central Zionist Archives, and there's a Henrietta Zold archive there. So I found the other side of the correspondence, okay? <laughs> the journal, uh, Irving Feynman had used the journal. He was the first person who wrote a um, biography. Um, but, <clears throat> and he had it trans uh, transcribed. But the, I found the transcription, which is at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe, terrible. I mean, it had so many mistakes, but at least I had it. So I, I, I copied the, the copy of it and, and corrected everything. And then I put them together in the, in the, in the way I've edited the book. Um, when she, she, she writes, whatever she writes, and then if um, she writes about a certain time in her life with him, then I have the letters inserted into the book so that it reads straight through. You don't have to read one and then read the other. And it, it gives a, a much fuller picture of her. No, <laughs> not unless I'm asked. Well, in the journal, there's one little section. I gave titles to these to these sections, and I call it "Dream Children." She says, she you know she writes when she really thinks that he's going to pop the question. You know, she says, "I hope he he asks me to marry him soon because I want to have twins, a boy and a girl, so he'll have both experiences." So she obviously had it in mind. Uh, but um, she, she knew, I mean, by the time the relationship was over, she was 48 years old. And uh, so, <laughs> well, she, <laughs> 1908, 1909, I don't think it was quite possible. I mean, anything is possible. But uh, at any rate, uh, she wasn't, she knew she would, she had proposals afterwards, two men, widowers, with children, proposed to her, and she wasn't interested. She hadn't been interested in any other man before, and she wasn't interested in any other man after it. Yeah. Well, he tried at first, but it was so awkward that she finally gave up. And, and they, now they were having, they remember the connection was because she was translating his books, The Legends of the Jews. Are any of you familiar with it? They're still in print. Okay, the JPS still prints them. Uh, and uh, her name as translator, by the way, are, is on the first two volumes. The third one, even though she did it all, wouldn't, let her, wouldn't put her name on it. 
And she finally said, I can't do it anymore. It's somebody else, although she had done a lot of the work, but somebody else's name was as translator in the fourth volume. Um, so she had to con talk to him, but she talked to him by letter now. They would drop letters and, yeah. Yeah. Well, it isn't clear. I don't have his journal, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, but I've seen his letters to her. He is interested in her, but it, you, it's, not, it's not very clear. He, he just uh, is, first of all, you have to understand, you know, I'm three quarters Litvak. You know, I mentioned my what, one grandfather and both my father's parents are Litvak. Litvaks think they're the best. <laughs> and if you're a Talmudic scholar, you even think more highly of yourself. And if you're the greatest Talmudic scholar of the age, boy, do you really think you're special. So, so he, he had this overwhelming sense of himself and his, his whole importance. And yeah, there must have been something. He knew she was a woman. But uh, he, he, he took terrible advantage of her. That's all you can say. Because he was he was interested in her as a friend, and that was unusual in those days. Well, I said they took long walks together. My daughter says I should say again they took they took long walks together. They had dinner together. He was always he was always at her house. Um, right? Yeah. And they were together all the time. They would go to this, uh, this uh, to the synagogue, uh, the seminary synagogue on, on Shabbat morning, and um, the uh, you know the men until quite recently the men sat on one side, the women sat on another. There was no mechitza, but all right. And he would at the end of the service he would just nod to her, and she'd get up and they'd walk out and they'd take a walk, okay. So uh, you know he he wanted to be with her, uh, but I think also. I kind of got the idea that the family put a lot of pressure on him. They didn't want him to marry this elderly blue stocking, okay? They wanted him to have a home and a family. Uh, she did ask him whether um, the age, it was because of the age. She finally, by the way, it took a long time till she confronted him, and she finally did. And of course, he said, oh, it never, never occurred to me that you were in love with me, you know? Um, but she said, is it because of the age difference? He said, oh, no, no. But what was he going to say? <laughs> You know, she is not as unattractive as most of the pictures. You see, um, I love this picture, and that's why I put it on the cover. This is what she looked like in her looked like in her early forties. Not a bad looking woman, but she. It's on the book, okay. She was. I guess everybody was born at home then. <laughs> oh no, her parents had come a year before from from Hungary. Uh, to, to Baltimore. They came in 1859. She was born at the end of 1860. One of her first memories is being held shoulders while the Lincoln um, uh, funeral went, went, went through Baltimore. And she saw it, 1865. Yeah. I don't remember what he says. I read it a thousand years ago. Yeah. No, no, she died of old age. She died, uh, she was uh, 84. No, no, it, it's a different, no, oh, no, um, oh no. She was part of the Jewish leadership of Palestine in the 20s though, when Golda was a young woman. 30s and 40s, I don't, I'm trying to remember in Golda's life, Golda came in the 20s. I, I don't think she dealt with the, remember Golda Mayer's, uh, she was really a party hack, Golda, for a long time, the Mapai party, and, and Henrietta Zoll wasn't involved in, in, in that. Uh, Golda wasn't involved in that as far as I know. The what? Um, 
it was very difficult <laughs> to get the Jews out of Europe, and and very few of them did get out, unfortunately. And those that came were were helped once they got to the shores, but they were helped by anybody, who, anybody who who was there. But it wasn't an organ; it couldn't have been an organized like a labor thing. Well, she was part of the leadership. Yeah, now, when they chose her to do it, to be <clears throat> on the Avad Lomi, she was really a compromise candidate, because the Orthodox wanted one group, and the and the Labour wanted another group, and and finally, and there were two men, and she was chosen as the third one. Uh, she went into social service after that, and then she went into youth aliyah. She wasn't involved in politics. She was kind of above politics. Yes. No, the Jewish Agency was created in 1929. This and, and uh, it's, it's a separate or agency. It wasn't part of any government. It never has been. Yeah. She made several trips to New York. How did she really organize Hadassah in America? Yeah, at the beginning, and, and um, when she came back from Eretz Yisrael in in 19. 10, 1909, 1910, she started talking with a group of women in February 1912. Uh, they met in Temple Emanuel Synagogue in February 1912, and they organized the uh, Hadassah group. But remember, there already was a Hadassah group. She just changed its, it, it wasn't just, it was no longer just an educational group. It became, it became a, um, a group that was going to do certain things, especially they were involved in, uh, in, um, <clears throat> milk for babies, um, trying to get rid of trachoma, you know, the eyes, um, all of that that she had seen when she was there in 1909. Mel? Well, I have one statement and a number of questions. Uh, <laughs> I want to make a, a statement for Matilda Schechter. Um, because one of Henrietta's uh, wonderful qualities was her independence. In other words, there was no way in which Hadassah was going to be absorbed by the Zionist organization of America. 1918, and, yeah. Well, I mean, it was independent. Um, and the same thing happened with um, uh, the organization that Matilda founded, which was um, the... Women's League. The Women's League, yeah. And there, even now, the Women's League for Conservative Judaism has an independent uh, building and an independent existence apart from the seminary and apart from the United Synagogue. Now, the questions, uh, are, one of them is unanswerable, but um, uh, that has to do with the fact that, that Hadassah wants to perceive Henrietta as an old woman. I mean, I remember we ran, uh, Bale and I and Jonathan Sarno ran a conference uh, many years ago on Henrietta's old at the seminary. And we got Hadassah to print a number of articles. And I went down with this picture that's on the cover, you know, and I said, won't you print this? Won't you put this in, in the article? Because all the pictures of Henrietta, you know, she was born when she was 65. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, well, we'll think about it. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the end of the story is that they didn't print it. And I, I don't know why that's, why that's the case. The question, is, yeah, what's the question? Why can't they recognize Henrietta? That's not my, that's not my uh, mind to answer. You know, Hadassah ladies want to answer? Hadassah ladies don't want to say that we don't understand your question because we have no recognition problems with Henrietta at any of her ages. Uh, all the pictures are always... Uh, I, I think it's getting better. I think, I think I've seen... Remember, this was, what, 15 years ago we were in that conference? Uh, I think that there was... Uh, one thing about the ZOA, I don't know if we want to talk about this, but when the ZOA was founded, you know, there were, had been <clears throat> several organiza Zionist organizations. Um, the most prominent was called the Federation of American Zionists. In 1918, they were united to form the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, <clears throat> and the idea was to make it regional, and therefore the women would be included with the men. 
And, a, and actually, the women agreed to do it. Henrietta Zold, of course, was the only one on the board. Did you see that way? I mean, she was always the only one on the, on the board and the leadership. Um, and they, and she, they agreed to do it. But what happened is the women didn't want to leave. They still met. Their chapter still met. So um, and it didn't it didn't make sense to do it just on a regional basis and not to do the the individual chapters. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, but it's something that you you kind of hinted at. Yes. I have a curiosity about the economics of working for the JPS. Uh, when her she and her husband were married, they were Well, she was working for the JPS. Actually, when they hired her in 1888, 1893, I'm sorry, it started in 18, um, <clears throat> they um, offered her $1,000 a year, and she took it. And they were actually willing to, they would have gone up to 1500 but she didn't know it, and she was too naive <laughs> to ask for more. So it was very difficult for them to sustain themselves there, and it was only really later because she, she got help that she could retire from, from there. There is someone established an annuity, a Julian Mack, if any of you know the name, was a major judge in, um, <clears throat> in the 1920s. But um, <clears throat> she and her mother lived with the with the, uh, a cook. You know what it was to cook in those days. It wasn't like, uh, you know, you couldn't go to the supermarket and get something. So um, with her two jobs and three jobs, she obviously couldn't be the cook. <laughs> Sandy. Well, when her mother died, it, that's uh, just about the period when she went to Palestine, because that's when she got the annuity. So she was able to do that. She didn't have to earn a living anymore. But how did she emotionally handle her mother's death? I, I don't know. Her mother was, was up in years, the way anybody handles a parent's death. It's hard, but you get over it. You know, it wasn't like the, the thing about Ginsburg, it was like, it was just like a sudden death, you know. Sure. It came after. When, she was, when she was already in, in, uh, in Palestine. And even the medical school was founded with the university and Hadassah together. She brought two nurses to Israel at the very beginning before, right, Earl, earlier. Yeah. In, in 1913, mm -hmm. in 1913, the mandate of what was a study group became practical Zionism. And they raised money with a challenge grant from Strauss. They raised the money. He matched the money. Two nurses, Landy and Kaplan, <laughs> were sent to Palestine. And they, along with the American Zionist Medical Unit, became the foundation on which eventually we now know the Hadassah Hospital. Uh, it's not the Hadassah Hospital. It's the Hadassah Medical Organization with two major hospitals and clinics. So yes, in fact, it was Henrietta Zold from a study group who said we have to do more, and they did. And today, I beg you, come with me to Jerusalem, and I'll be happy to give you a tour of Adassa Hospital. Both of them, the two of them. <laughs> um, one more question. Yes, sir. Like this guy, <laughs> Warburg. <laughs> that crowd was not pro Zionist, no. Well, no, no. What happened is that a, a very important figure in America became a Zionist. His name was Brandeis. And when he became a Zionist, he really he, Louis Brandeis. Who, um, before he was he in 19 he was he was nominated <clears throat> to the Supreme Court in 1916, um, and about in during the period of World War One, he became the leader of American Zionism, and he had um, such charisma and such 
he was so important to the American Jewish community that he, and he also knew how to write that he was able to establish a rationale for Zionism that many American Jews accepted. Now not all accepted accepted it. It was a long time until most of American Jews became pro-Zionist, actually not until World War II. Okay. Even the American Jewish Committee that's so pro-Zionist now was anti-Zionist or non-Zionist in the period of World War I, uh, II. Okay. But he, that's, that foundation what was, was laid in 19, in, during the, the World War I period. This is my husband, all right. <laughs> She's been criticized for even publishing this journal. And it's so private and so personal that she did a disservice to Andrea Wood Phillips. And Andrea would never have, have countenance. The, the Not true. Her. All right. That's what you do, guys. And also, just for years, she tried to get the, to, the family held on the diary. It wouldn't allow it to be printed because they thought it was too personal. But yet she succeeded. So I want her to tell you the story of how she succeeded as a conclusion. <laughs> Sharon said, so no more questions. All right. You're more than welcome to come up to afterward. And actually, Bella will be signing books, so you can line us and ask more questions. All right. Well, I, I did have to work a long time to get it. The letters, as I say, were in archives, so I didn't have any trouble with them. And the first things that I that I had written about it, and that I talked about at that lecture with Mel and Jonathan Sarna, uh, <clears throat> uh, were based on the letters. The journal, as I said, it was in the Schlesinger Library. Feynman had used it, but the family didn't want it to be printed as such. The Zoll family. She had she had one sister who remained who was who um, she whom she predeceased. Um, her name was um, Bertha. Okay, uh, Bertha Levin, and Bertha uh, lived in in. Baltimore, as, as I said. By the time I wanted to do this, of course, she was gone, but she had living children. And the two oldest children especially didn't want me to, to publish it. She, um, <clears throat> that, and I wrote to my old teacher in Baltimore, the head of the Baltimore Hebrew College, and he tried to get them. No, 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 no. But then when I gave that lecture, I, mean, I remember when I gave that lecture with Mel and Jonathan, who should appear but Eli Ginsberg? Now, Eli Ginsberg is the son of, <laughs> of Louis Ginsberg. Uh, what? And Adele. and Adele Ginsberg, okay. And I was really amazed that he came. <laughs> I walked, he came up to me because I didn't know him yet. He came up to me and, and I said, you know, I really would like to publish the journal, you know, because what I talked about was just the letters. He said, I don't see why not. Look at all the years it's been. You know, this is 1990. You know, and they're all long gone. Um, and so when the family found that out, then I was able to publish the, the journal as well. Okay. Um, okay. Sharon is getting rid of us, so we'll <laughs> I'll be in the back if anyone is interested in purchasing the book. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y, New York, and all of our programs please visit us at 92ny.org.